Hi, my name is Gabriel Rockhill. I'm a member of the Liberation School Collective, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by historian Jock Powells, who I'll introduce, and then we'll get into the conversation very quickly. So uh, Jacques Powell was born in Belgium and uh, began uh, his studies there, but has made the majority of his life in Canada. He's the author of a number of historical works that provide a great overview of the last 250 years of class struggle. I'll just mention my favorite three to begin with, The Great Class War, that looks at World War I, but also investigates the entire background to World War I and digs deep into the 19th century, going back to the French Revolution. The Myth of the Good War, which is the most succinct and I think authoritative account of World War II and everything that people should know about that particular time period. And Big Business and Hitler, which goes into the background between behind the rise of Nazism and fascism within the European context and, of course, the financial interests that were backing that. Uh, one of the things that's particularly interesting about Jacques Powell's work is the way in which he combines a historical perspective with a geographic engagement that is resolutely internationalist. And so I know that he is not only uh, spent a lot of his life between Europe and Canada, but also traveled very widely, and that comes to bear on the work that he does. And so our conversation today is really a unique opportunity to have a perspective on the deep history of class struggle within the kind of Euro-American context, but always situated within a global environment. So welcome, Jacques. I'm really excited about our conversation today. Well, thank you very much, Gabriel. It's a pleasure to be here, to be your guest. Well, I'd like to start with a question about your particular approach to history and how it differs from the dominant bourgeois perspectives on the past. Right? The latter often indulges in stories of great leaders, conflicts between nations, and it therefore obfuscates or even eliminates class struggle as a driving force in history. And by contrast, your focus on class struggle is such that you analyze from an international perspective uh, the, the conflicts that exist not only between the kind of ruling capitalist class and the proletariat, but also between the capitalist core and the you know, colonial so-called periphery. And I'm curious why it is so important for you and your approach to history to always center class struggle. And why has bourgeois history, the kind of dominant history that we're subjected to within the Western capitalist world, sought to eliminate it? Well, Thank you, Gabriel. Um, as they always say, when they respond to a question like that, that's a good question. Because that, when the time that it takes to say that, you can actually think of what you could process, how you could possibly answer this. You know? So that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, no, what am I going to say? Well, no, <laughs> I know what, this, what the, uh, what, something to say about it anyways. I was, as a child, already keenly interested in history. Um, and I was fascinated in living in Belgium, the Middle Ages in Bruges and Ghent were all around us. And of course, you learn about the battles in the Middle Ages and about the Crusades and about all those kings, some of them nasty, some of them good kings, you know, and mighty emperors. And I learned about Alexander the Great and the battles he won and how he beat the pantaloons of the Persians and so forth, you know. And I knew a lot, a lot, a lot. I was a little kid and I was writing like an encyclopedia. And even now, people sometimes say, you must have you know, like a photographic memory. And that's wrong, wrong, wrong. Because history, as far as I'm concerned, is not about knowing all these things and remembering years and dates and names of kings and queens and you name it. It's about understanding things. You know? And this is something that I learned. My eyes were opened when I went first year to university in Ghent and Belgium after high school where I had learned a lot of history. We learned history systematically. And I'm grateful for that because of course, you can begin to understand historical facts if at least you don't know some historical facts. So the knowing is not to be neglected, but the understanding has to come on top of that and is ultimately more important, right? Because in a sense, we have to answer the questions about facts. The facts themselves don't speak for themselves as some people think, you know, and it's like some people say, well, give me the facts. Well, the facts are themselves don't say anything. And besides, there's really a subjective choice involved if I say you tell you these are the facts. Because for every fact I can give you, there's some facts I cannot talk about. And that's one of the typical features, by the way, in much of historiography today. They'll tell you certain things, but they don't talk about other things. You know what I mean? Like they just simply certain things are ignored. I'm thinking about my history 
of uh, the United States in the Second World War, the myth of the Good War, where I talk a lot about the, the, the involvement of corporations and their role and uh, how they determined what Washington did or didn't do or didn't want to do. Um, I mean, the, the Second World War in many ways from the US perspective was very much about markets, about raw materials, about control of countries, imperialism if you want. But you never know that if you read most history books. It's as if imperialism doesn't exist. It's as if these, it's as if the corporations were only there meekly, quietly responding to a demand to, for weapons, you know, it's not as if they had nothing to do with it, where this demand came from. Same in Germany. You know, you learn that Hitler ordered weapons and waged war. And after the war, these corporations said, we knew nothing. We were just told to order this stuff and we just produce it. We don't ask what they do with it, you know? So uh, this, this is totally wrong. It's, you need to look at, at certain facts that are not mentioned. So back to the facts then. When I was a kid and I was fascinated by all these historical facts and I learned a lot of it. And um, then I learned more and more and I went to high school and I learned systematically. We started off with Caesar in Belgium, you know, how he conquered the land of Gaul and we went on to Napoleon, but we never made it to the 20th century because that was a bit too tricky. That's when it became a bit, you know, hot potato. Our teacher did not want to, well, you knew that Hitler had been around. It was a bad guy, of course, you know, you learned that from home because my parents had lived under the occupation the first in the second world war. But I mean, where Hitler came from or what, what Nazism was and what fascism was, they never mention about that, you know. All, that we, all I remember in the First World War was that we made it to the First World War and Belgium was on the side of the good guys and we beat the Germans and that was, that was a happy ending. And then the Germans did, did it again and we were again the right side, we suffered, but we won again, right? So um, you have all these, these facts and I learned all that and I, so I knew a lot of facts. And I thought I was pretty good at history, you know, and people told me I was good because I had a great memory, you know, it was all about having a memory, you know, and that's what I say. Even today I'm told, oh, you have a great photographic memory. I, I resent being told that because I think I'm, I'm more prouder that I understand a few things rather than I remember everything, you know. Remembering things, facts, that's trivia, you know. It's trivia. And I remember being shocked at one point when I was here in Canada fairly early on and I watched an American TV program, which I rarely did. And it was a question, it was a question about history. And the question was, name the first 10 presidents or something like that. I mean, hello, to me, that's not history. That's not, that's not, that's useless. That's trivia, right? That's trivia. If I want to know that, I mean, I can look it up. I mean, like, there's no merit to memorizing that and knowing that, you know, that's not, that's not good history. So anyways, when I first went to university, we had a professor and his name was Don. He was quite a, an expert in social history. And he explained something that really opened my eyes. He talked about the 19th century. And he explained how the interests of the land owning aristocracy conflicted with the interests of the industrial and financial bourgeoisie. Even though they were in many ways both in the same wavelength against the, the rising proletariat. But I mean, that basic idea that the interests of land ownership conflict with the interests of commerce and industry, you know, which is, of course, pretty essential, basic materialist history and Star Wars has the, or the class struggle built into it. That really made me suddenly say, my God, you know, I can understand something now rather than simply no facts. And this is actually was without giving any facts at all. No names were mentioned. No battles were cited. You know, no, no, there was just simply a fact of the 19th century that in general, all over Europe, you had the nobility who were the landowners versus the rising bourgeoisie who were typically industrialists and bankers. Simple as that, you know, and shit. You know, I thought this was really, pardon my, my Francais, you know, <laughs> this, this was really an eye opener, right? And I took it from there, right? And I suddenly forgot the Middle Ages, you know, and I suddenly moved, delved into the 19th century. I did my thesis over there already on, on strikes in the 19th century and I became interested in the labor movement. And I heard, started hearing about a guy called Karl Marx, who I had virtually never heard of before, except in a very negative kind of connotation. So context. So that was for me like a real, real eye opener. And um, to me then this, this whole, this brought me to a Marxist approach of history, where you talk about historical materialism, where the material conditions of life determine the way we think rather than the other way around.
of course, not ideas that move us to do certain things. It's the way we do things that cause us to think in a certain way. And I explained that in, in, you know, in, in a number of occasions in my different books, how that is important. And this is much more important than in terms of understanding what happened rather than knowing more facts, knowing more names of people, knowing more dates, battles, blah, 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 blah. So to me, that that was a, a real, a real uh, revelation, I must say, you know, uh, that's that's where an, an epiphany, I should say, you know, that's to me when I, I became really an historian in the sense that I understood then that it's all about about understanding the past and to understand it, then class struggle is a key. Historical materialism is one way, but class struggle is, is the key. That's why my book on the First World War is called, is called the Great Class War, because it was a class war. In fact, the argument against the class approach that I've read, because I occasionally read books that are written by, by bourgeois historians, by conventional historians, not in fact, how could you not? Now, there's so many of them. You know, and there was a, it was a, an argument against class struggle, whereas, wherein, I forgot the author, where he, he argued that class struggle was not all that important, really not like Marxists argue. And the example was the First World War, because that was obviously countries against countries, you know, and class struggle had nothing to do with it. I said, you know, excusez-moi, right? And that's when I wrote a book of 500 pages about class struggle, nothing but class struggle pretty well in the, in the First World War. And I want to point out something here. A real eye-opener for me has been a recent book that I read recently about but five, six years ago, by Losurdo, a wonderful author, one that really opened my eyes to. It's called La Lotte de Classe, the class, the class struggle. I don't know if it exists in English, but he points out something very important, that class struggle is not, as it is always simplistically represented by non-Marxist authors who tend to create a false image of Marxism and then shoot it down, because what they shoot down is a straw man, right? They don't really tackle, they don't even understand what Marxism is all about, right? So they create this idea the class struggle is simply, you know, the, the upper class against lower class, right? The bourgeoisie against the, 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 the proletariat. Well, the, the, the reality, of course, is much more complex. The, the, the social and economic reality and the concept of class struggle is much more sophisticated and complex than that. Class struggle, as um, Losurdo points out, is also class struggle within classes. There's a class struggle in the bourgeoisie because there's the upper bourgeoisie and the lower bourgeoisie. There's the grand bourgeoisie, the bankers, the industrialists, you know, the filthy rich people. And there's the petite bourgeoisie, the petit bourgeois folks that make a living that are independent. They're not wage earners, you know, but I mean, they're simply make, barely making a living, essentially, in their little business. They're under the gun right now because of, all, among other things, the COVID crisis. So there's these conflicts. There's also conflicts even within the, the, the within the industrialists. There are certain sectors of, of, the, of industry that compete with other sectors, you know, um, for certain things. Uh, there's of course each, each sector. There's companies that compete with each other. Conflicts being big companies, that's in some ways a class struggle as well. You know, so there's a different kinds of class struggle within the class struggles. And of course, there's the class struggle domestically between the French bourgeoisie, say, and the French, the French workers, the, the salaria, the salaria versus the patrona, you know, the wage earners against the, the basically those who, who provide labor, so to speak, to use that term, you know, even though they are the ones who take advantage of labor. Anyways, you have all these, 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 these different aspects that, that illustrate the complexity of the class struggle, but there's the international aspects as well, because there's a class struggle between countries that are capitalist and countries that are proletarian. And of course, I mean the global south, the global north, right? In many ways, the global south is the proletarian, and the global north is the is the capitalist. It's as simple as that, in some ways, you know. Perhaps too simple. Too simple. I don't know. I don't think so. I think with these sometimes these concepts, simple as they are, are the key to beginning to understand. We can then take it from there and and work it out the details, you know. So that is um, that is my view about the importance of class struggle. And I must say that. Uh, in my studies, and I've been lucky in that I had, had was did my undergraduate in Europe and did a lot of history over there, and then I went on to to Canada and did my uh, PhD in German history, Nazi Germany. But I also took advantage of my time at graduate school to learn to to learn American history and Canadian history, and I even found time afterwards because I loved studying to do a PhD in political science, and I uh, learned a lot of things about politics and, and domestically and internationally 
so that this really opened my eyes. And each time, wherever, whenever I came to speak in my studies, you know, wherever I arrived, class struggle, I always found to be the light that in the darkness, it really helped me to understand and therefore helped me to explain. And uh, that's why, for example, I decided that I needed to explain the First World War in terms of a class struggle and call it the Great Class War. So I find I find that that bourgeois history, conventional history, historiography, with its emphasis on the great men and now also women, you know, of history, you know, can begin to compete with that model, you know, of the class analysis approach. And that's not only true for history, but I, I study political science as well. And it's also very, very true for political science. You know, the, the class analysis is the key to understanding the, the, the alpha and omega. Simple no, as that. No, uh, absolutely. And, and one of the elements in Dominico Lasordo's work that I see very clearly in your own as well is that class struggle also is the colonial struggle, right? The imperialist struggle that you alluded to. So right. it has to do with the national question and racism, but it also has to do with domestic slavery, right? And the, the struggle between uh, uh, different genders and sexes, right? So that these are not somehow separate from class struggle. And I'm, I'm sure we'll return to these, some of these issues later in the conversation. But what I thought would be helpful is almost following the timeline of some of your work where you begin around 1789 and the bourgeois revolutions in the European context and then you kind of use them as backdrop for understanding World War One, World War Two, and and then eventually the present of course because that's where we're anchored in the contemporary moment of class struggle. So let's begin with uh, the great class war. One of the things that you outline in this book that I think is uh, incredibly important is that there was class struggle in the 19th century that can perhaps best be described, at least in its most general form, as a struggle between the aristocracy, right, the old landed aristocracy, the emergent bourgeoisie or the capitalist class, and then the proletariat or the working class. So I'd like to ask you to perhaps just map out for us, if you could, what the main forces of class struggle were, as you see them kind of coming out of the French Revolution and structuring the long 19th century? I know that's a big question, but I really appreciate the big picture view that you have on the 19th century that allows us to see things at a kind of altitude that uh, doesn't get lost in the kind of specialist discourses of, of many historians. Well, one of the shortcomings of conventional bourgeois historiography, I find, is that it's, 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 it reflects binary thinking, a, a black and white, white kind of approach. Good versus evil, you know, us versus them, upper class versus lower class, revolutionaries against counter-revolutionaries. Well, that's pretty basic in many ways, but it's all wrong. I Meaning it's all wrong, it's, it's inadequate. Uh, reality is much more complex than that. Reality is binary. Uh, I make that point with respect to the First World War. We may get back to that later on. But um, reality is much more complex than that. So if you look at the history of the 19th century, there was class struggle. That class struggle was not binary. I referred to Losodo's basically definition of class struggle, where he points out that it's much more complex uh, than just a, those guys, that class against that class, you know, upper class against lower class. It's also within classes. It's also international. There's an international dimension. You name it. Same thing is true for the first for the 19th century. The 19th century, the century that was produced by the that was the, the, the child, if you want, of the French Revolution, and would end up being the mother, you know, of the First World War. That's a very important point. Okay, the historians call it the long 19th century. It started in 1789 with the French Revolution, and it ends in 1914 or 1918, you know, with the First World War. Right. So it's a Essentially, it starts with a revolution that produces wars, the Napoleonic Wars, and it ends with a major war that produces revolution, you know, the Russian Revolution. The dialectic of war and revolution is extremely important. That's the main theme of my book uh, on the First World War, the Great Class War. Maybe we can talk about that later, but right now I want to talk about the number of players involved. The number of players, the French Revolution starts as uh, revolutionaries, those who want change, drastic change. They want to get rid of the Ancien Regime. And the Ancien Regime, that's a monarchy. And the monarch is the primus inter pares, the number one of the aristocracy. 
and the aristocracy is allied with the church, well, with the upper levels of the church hierarchy, the princes of the church, the prelate, prelates, you know, the bishops, the cardinals, the pope, of course, outside of France, you know what I'm saying, not the parish priests, they are part of the, the, of the revolutionaries, they won't change. So there's the revolution, the counter-revolutionaries, those who don't want revolution, the aristocracy, the church, the king, of course, and the distance, the pope. First, the revolutionaries, and there they are. They are the, the common folks of Paris, the sans culotte, as they call them, right? They, these are mostly artisans, not so much factory workers, because the Industrial Revolution has just barely started in France. It'll become, come on big time in the 19th century. And indeed, what we'll see is that there'll be a change in the nature of the working class too. Uh, that working class, that with its revolutionary potential and ambitions and desire and drive will be itself be transformed from a mass of mostly petty bourgeois artisans in Paris to factory workers, you know, in places like Lille, Saint-Étienne, Lyon, and all over the place. And that's important as well, because the topography plays a role, as I try to point out in my book on the French Revolution, which is something else again. So there's um, the, the revolutionaries, those who want to change, who want radical change from the system of the Ancien Regime, include the, the, the commoners, you know, the little folks, you know, exemplified, epitomized by the sans culotte, right? And also the bourgeoisie, the petite bourgeoisie, which is what the sans culotte are, and the upper bourgeoisie. And these are merchants, especially, because it's some time of mercantile capitalism, you know, not yet industrial financial capitalism, right? Mercantile capitalism. So mostly people who became rich because of the trade that's been booming ever since Columbus and the boys, the time of the great discoveries, which is the beginning of capitalism, as you may know, right? And these merchants have become very rich, but they're not powerful. They have plenty of wealth, but no political power. Whereas, and they are jealous of the nobility who have plenty of power, but no, very little less wealth compared to them. By the way, where does the wealth of the French bourgeoisie come from? These merchants are mostly from places like Bordeaux, or seaports, because they're involved not in domestic trade, but international trade. And what's that trade in? The answer is slavery. Slavery is a source of the great wealth of the French bourgeoisie at that time, the mercantile bourgeoisie. Balzac would say later on, you know, behind every great fortune that hides a crime. Well, the crime hiding behind the great fortune of the French bourgeoisie of Bordeaux and elsewhere was the crime of slavery, a major crime, by the way, abolished by the French revolutionaries in the most radical phase of the revolution, namely under that bad guy, Robespierre. Why is he a bad guy? He abolished slavery. And Napoleon's supposed to be a good guy. He actually reintroduced slavery. You know, crazy, isn't it? One of the absurdities of bourgeois history to declare Napoleon a hero. He abolished slavery. He brought slavery back. And to declare Robespierre a criminal, a bloodsucker, you know, he actually he abolished slavery. He should have a statue in the middle of Place de la Concorde in Paris, you know, on top of the Eiffel Tower, as far as I'm concerned, and not Napoleon. Anyways, so you have these two revolutionary elements, and they are the bourgeoisie and the working class, so to speak, the proletariat, if you want. But it's not really a proletariat, because they are they own property. They, they, they are petty bourgeois, right? But they are revolutionary. And the revolution, the, basically the, the dirty work, the hard work is mostly done by the ordinary folks that do the fighting, the storming of the Bastille, that's their job, right? But they don't have the qualities to provide a leadership. And the bourgeoisie takes on over the leadership of the revolution and takes control of the revolution. Hijacks the revolution, you might say, right? Now, there's some there's a problem there at one point when, when I won't get into explaining into explaining Napoleon and then the return of the monarchy, but in the 19th century, that'll continue. The revolution, the, the bourgeoisie will remain a revolutionary class, meaning expecting more benefits from a revolution, including the, the idea that the bourgeoisie wants a state that's going to be at its service, the way that the Ancien Regime was a state at the service of the aristocracy and the church. Right? Now, the bourgeoisie doesn't necessarily want a, you know, want, want a major revolution, a, a, a red revolution. They don't want the red flag, no. They want a France that's going to be bourgeois, where they can control the state and organize it you know, to meet their needs and achieve their desiderata, which means, for example, an easier way to do business as opposed to all these domestic tolls and so on, you know, and, you know, the, the, and have other pay taxes, have the aristocracy and the church now 
pay for some of the costs of running the government as opposed to the bourgeoisie as in the past. So the bourgeoisie in 1830 and 1848, the next two waves of revolutions is still a revolutionary class. And again, as before, you know, their allies are the common people. Now more and more factory workers and fewer and fewer artisans, but still. And these, once again, 1830, 1848, who does the fighting, the killing, the dying, you know, the fighting in the streets, you know, the ordinary people. Who takes on the leadership, who hijacks the revolutions and takes advantage of it, basically harvests the fruit of the revolution? It's the bourgeoisie. It's not that simple. No, there are advantages, there are gains for ordinary people. The revolution of 1848, you know, the, even the bourgeoisie cannot prevent the, the, the demand for the final definitive abolition of this of slavery to be introduced. And that's when indeed slavery will be abolished for good in France, right? And they even have to introduce universal suffrage. Imagine that. And the bourgeoisie does not want universal suffrage. Why not? Because they're a tiny minority of the population. If you give every yokel in town the, 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 the vote, I mean, they're going to vote you, outvote you. And there's, I could cite liberal authors at the time, Losudo has done that in his wonderful book on, the, on, on, on liberalism, you know, because they know very well that if the masses that have no money come to power, it's going to be at the expense of the few who have the money, right? It's like say today, the 99%, really, if they would come to power, the 1% that are now controlling most of the wealth in the world are, are bound to lose their wealth. It's pretty obvious. You don't have to be a genius to understand that. So they are against universal suffrage. In fact, one of the lessons of the 1848 revolution for the bourgeoisie in France and elsewhere, also in Germany, where there's also a revolution in 1848, will be that those ordinary yokels that are our allies during the revolution, have been our allies, are dangerous because they want too much. They want a kind of, they want too much democracy, much more democracy than we want. They also want social benefits. They want a sort of, you might say, kind of an employment insurance. They, next thing you know, they want higher wages, they want pensions, they want all these things. My God, that's the end of the, end of the world, certainly the end of our privileges. So the lesson of 1848 already, you know, especially after the so-called June days, an uprising of the working class, having made the revolution against the monarchy, they are now actually rising up against the bourgeois leaders of the revolution themselves, right? Who are now getting very, very worried about that, right? And who can think of nothing but repression. Right? And then solid dictatorship, as they had done in 1799 under a fellow called Bonaparte. So a new Bonaparte, a new coup d'etat, where they eliminate, where they put a stop to all this demand for democracy, all this nonsense, and they slap on, they basically introduce dictatorship. That's Napoleon III, right? And uh, from that moment on, the bourgeoisie says, we're now against revolution because we have achieved what we wanted. We have now control of the state. Uh, the French government, the French state under Napoleon III is very much a bourgeois state. It's a super, an uber bourgeois state at the service of the bourgeoisie. And that's what they love it and they want to keep it that way, right? And the masses have to now shut up, go home, go back to the factories and work 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week. You know. That's normal. It can be otherwise. They don't really see the possibility. It'd be the end of the world if you give them the Sunday off. You know, my God, that's you know, we can never compete in the world. That's the arguments even today. You know, we cannot less than eight hours a day, less than five days a week. It's impossible. You know, and we couldn't run the economy like that. That's still the arguments that we hear today. So the bourgeoisie was a revolutionary class in 1789. It was still a revolutionary class in 1830. It was still a revolutionary class in 1848 when the revolution started until they took it over and wanted to stop the revolutionary process. And then they stopped being a revolutionary class. In fact, then they become a counter-revolutionary class. They, so they you might say abandon the camp of the revolutionaries, leave the proletariat to call it that in there by itself and move over you know, to the camp of the counter-revolutionaries where they are welcomed by the way, by, so to speak, by the aristocracy in the church. And they now become good friends of the church again and the aristocracy. The bourgeoisie typically in France, for example, in 1848, you know, will reconcile itself with the church. They'll realize that the church is very useful for the purpose of socializing the little folks, you know, especially in the countryside. The church can bring in, you know, even the vote of the 
farmers, the peasants, and so on. The church can tell people, go to church, you go to church, pray, you know, salvation is not of this earth, you know, it's by the sky, that, that idea, you know, that idea that it's, that it's very much still alive today, actually, in, um, in, uh, in the United States, as I believe, you know, the idea is not to seek social justice for all in this life, but find Jesus, you know, and make sure that you're going to have, you're going to be okay in the afterlife, it's by the sky, as they used to say, already, the anarchists in the late 19th century all over, not only in the United States, also in Europe. So, so essentially then, uh, there's a big moment in 1848 when the bourgeoisie abandons what is sometimes called the heroic phase of its history, which lasted from 1789 to 1848 when it was revolutionary. Now, you could say, well, that, that turning point was not so much 1848, it was that already, but why not add 1871 to that? Because that's when the Paris Commune demonstrates once again to the bourgeoisie the danger emanating from the lower classes with a large number, you know, the danger of democracy and the danger of revolution. Because as I argue in my book, The Great Class War, you know, revolutions tend to further enhance, you know, promote the cause of democratization. Right. It's because of revolutions that we get more democracy, generally speaking, not suddenly, you know, democracy, 100% sprang whole from the brow of a revolutionary Jupiter, so to speak. No, no, but more democracy, you know, advance towards democracy. There's no full-fledged democracy anywhere in sight today, right? And wars tend to serve to inhibit the revolution, the, the, the democratic process tend to stop democracy and roll back democracy. Yeah. That is the moral of the story. That's why the French Revolution basically, you know, started as a revolution in France, a class war in France, and it turned into an international war, which is also a class war. Yeah. Yeah. War, the revolutions will lead to wars because wars are essentially counter-revolutionary, right? Of course, you can also have, you also have revolutionary wars. It's never that simple, but I'm talking about generally speaking, Wars has served to, you know, to, to, um, to uh, revolutions have, have, have led to wars because wars were a way to try to stop the revolution and actually undo the work of revolution. And while I'm dealing with this, this dialectic of war and revolution, I should point out right away that the, as you would expect in dialectic way of thinking, if revolutions lead to wars, then wars also lead to revolutions. It works both ways, right? Why do wars lead to revolutions? You know, because wars already, of course, wars are pretty awful. And the people that serve, that suffer the most in that they have to do, have to do most of the killing and the dying you know, are of course the ordinary people. It's typically the folks on top, you know, they, they're staying behind. You know, they, don't, they send, their, they send the, the peasants and the workers to, to the war, right? General Haig was safely behind the lines on July 1st, 1916, when 60,000 Brits, British soldiers were eliminated you know, by machine gun fire as they were sent to attack the German lines, right? But these were the proles, you know, and the, the, the Haig didn't care. He was, in, ups, and he was in the back, you know, smoking big cigars and drinking a brandy, you know, uh, as, he, as he was going to the reports. He was actually sometimes upset when there was not enough casualties on his side because he liked the idea of culling the dangerous masses, if you know what I mean. So this is really how, uh, how then wars, wars, the suffering is the low, lower classes that do the suffering. The lower classes, the existence of the lower classes of ordinary people in the 19th century was already very difficult as it was. Lots of misery and poverty, right? And wars actually make your life even more miserable and you make even greater poverty. They bring hunger. They cause what you might say an uber pauperization. And Karl Marx argued that revolution will happen when the proletariat is pauperized to such an extent, pushed their back against a wall to such an extent by the conditions created by capitalism that they'll have no choice but to respond with the fist of revolution. Right? It was believed for a while in the late 19th century that Marx was wrong because life was getting better for ordinary workers, for a labor aristocracy. We should talk about that later on, you know, but the war certainly got rid of that illusion in a hurry because the war pauperized even the most spoiled of the labor aristocracy. And I illustrate that in my book on the First World War by saying that in Germany, the pride of the working class 
prior to the First World War have been the fact that they could eat meat once a day. What a luxury, you know, be a sausage and sauerkraut and potatoes on your plate every day. Voila, you know, thanks to Bismarck and the German state. So when the state is threatened, we go to war to defend it. But during that war, the sausages disappear from the, from the table and even the potatoes disappear from the table. You know, and that's when that was the popularization that actually pushed the previously pampered German proletariat, you know, with their backs against the wall and caused them to make a revolution in 1918, as they did, which came close to succeeding. It didn't, but you know, you know what I'm saying. So, so wars tend to popularize people to the point where they're going to make a revolution. So just as revolutions lead to wars, wars lead to revolutions. And the most famous example of that, one of them is the 19, 1905, when the war against Japan caused the trigger the revolution in, in Russia in 1905. And the ultimate example, the one that closes that century, characterized by the dialectic of revolution and war, starting with a revolution, the French Revolution, that caused a series of international wars. It ends with a great war, 1918, that produces the great revolution. So that you say, might say that you know, the circle is complete. It's not, because it will continue even after that. We'll talk probably later on, I imagine, about the Second World War. So I'm back to my story now. In, I was trying to explain how the binary thinking doesn't cannot possibly do justice to the fact that there were more than two players in the field of revolutionary and uh, revolutions and wars. You know, the bourgeoisie actually, you might say, was in there with on the side of the revolutionaries in 1789, 1830, 1848, but against revolution in 1871, against revolution, of course, at the end of the First World War. We shouldn't forget that at the end of the First World War, the war conditions, the popularization triggered by the war caused revolution not only in Russia and in Germany, but there was a revolutionary situation in France, in Belgium, in England, in Holland, in Switzerland, neutral countries. Yeah. But you know what? You never hear about that. You know why not? Because bourgeoisie, bourgeois the historiography doesn't want you to hear about it. It's too painful. Did you know that Lloyd George was actually ordering, well, ready to order the bombing of Liverpool and Belfast, the popular districts over there because of the unrest among the working class that was actually following the example or trying to follow, or so it seemed, the example of the Ruskies, the, Bol the Bolshies, and bullshiness was actually infecting the working class neighborhoods of Belfast, Glasgow, Liverpool, and Lloyd George and Churchill were ready to actually send in the Air Force and bomb them, preferably with poison gas, as they were ready to do in, um, in obstreperous kind of colonies like, like Iraq, as my friend George W. Bush used to call it, formerly Mesopotamia, right? So there, there was revolutionary situations in Europe at the end of the First World War, not only in Russia and Germany and Hungary, but also in Belgium and France and England, elsewhere. There was mutinies in the British army. You know, There was actually also as troops that were sent to fight with the whites against the reds in Russia, French troops and British troops, the, many of the men ran over to the side of the Bolsheviks. And that's why, that's why London and Paris and Washington and had to give up the idea of intervening uh, against the Bolsheviks in the civil war in Russia. So anyway, so my point here was that, 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 that the binary kind of thinking you know, does not do justice. It cannot begin to understand the, the revolution. And again, I, I, I've read quite a few books, obviously, on the French Revolution and on the 19th century. And this, this historians, bourgeois historians, struggle with that. They don't really understand you know, what, what happened to the bourgeoisie, so to speak. And I want to mention a book in this context, because we're here to recommend some good books, right? I already recommended uh, Lo Surdo. Everything, anything written by Lasurdo is magnificent and ought to be read. I love Rosur Lasurdo. I'm very grateful to my Italian friend Silvio, who recommended reading Lasurdo to me when I didn't had never heard of the guy about 15 years ago. And I'm very proud that I got to know him personally. I had uh, lunch with him and you know, a couple of times. So uh, Lasurdo, but but uh, George Lukash, the, the German philosopher. George Lukács, well, Hungarian, sorry what I'm saying, Hungarian, uh, wrote a book called The Destruction of Reason. The Zerstörung der Vernunft. I, I struggled through reading that book in the 80s when I was a graduate student, and it was hard work, but boy, boy, a real eye-opener, because he essentially tells the story of philosophy in Germany and elsewhere as it reflects what I just said. 
and how the bourgeoisie, the mentality of the bourgeoisie, the way of thinking of the bourgeoisie, and of course of bourgeois philosophers, you know, changes from Kant and Hegel, who are still smiling upon the revolution, you know, to guys like Nietzsche, who actually dis disgusted the revolution, you know, and who calls the 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 the, the, the common arts, you know, like basically swine and things like that. You know how how this whole story of the bourgeoisie abandoning its the heroic face, exiting the heroic phase of its history and abandoning the cause of revolution to become determined counter-revolutionaries, siding with the aristocracy and the church and basically des despising and fighting against everything that's revolutionary. And by the way, it is because they hate revolution, they fear revolution and they despise democracy. That is why they will want the war to happen in 1914. The idea that the First World War was an accident of history, you know, Unwanted is absolute, utter, pathetic nonsense. You know, they were not sleepwalking in the war at all. You know, like what some historian has called it, they knew what they wanted. They wanted the war. And here I want to mention, am I going too fast already? About, well, well, I, I, I want to get to that, right? Just a minute. Is that okay? Just yeah, yeah, sure. But, I, I want to, uh, everyone to understand kind of how your historical understanding, to use the term that you highlighted, of the latter half of the 19th century yeah, really yeah, sets the stage for World War I. Right. And so if I've understood both your work and what you've said correctly, then by the time you get to 1848 and uh, uh, the revolutions of 1848, and then certainly by 1871 with the Paris Commune, there's a play of forces where the former ruling class of under feudalism, the aristocracy and the remnants of the aristocracy become then allies with the new ruling class of the bourgeoisie, the ascendant ruling class, yeah. and they join forces, counter-revolutionary forces, right, right, to really battle and attempt to crush the new threat, That's which right. is the new revolutionary class, right. which is the working class. Right. Right? Yes. And so I wonder if you could at once touch on how this moment of the Paris Commune and the alliance between the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy against the working class provides a kind of new uh, how to put it, that the map of class struggle shifts right. considerably, and that then this is directly related to your account of World War I, right? Because right. it's precisely the threat of the, burgeoning, of the burgeoning working class movement, if it's real or perceived, as you point out, that the bourgeoisie wants to crush along with the remnants of the aristocracy. Right. And so I'd also like to hear you on one of the most remarkable, but I think important theses in your book on World War I, and that is that the ruling class, uh, the bourgeoisie, obviously, but also the aristocracy wanted war as a way of staving off revolution. That's correct. Could yeah. you kind of explain why yeah. that was the case and elucidate why also this strategy ultimately backfired, right? Yes, yeah. Because we have the child of revolution born of the war that was desired by the ruling class. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. It was one of the ironies of history. Well, I sensed that I was getting too fast towards the war already, uh, and so I stopped myself there in my tracks. But yes, it's very important. So the middle of the 19th century, 1848 to 1871, you know, that's the turning point. And that's when it becomes evident by 1870, say by the 1850s, that things have changed. First of all, the Industrial Revolution has made, made brought a lot about a lot of changes in France and throughout Western Europe. The working class is now factory workers mostly, no longer the artisans. So the sans culotte, the Parisian sans culotte, you know, tailors, hat makers, you know, whatever they were, you know, are pretty well no longer are not gone, but no longer very important. The factory workers in the mines and in the in the in the, in the textile mills, you know, and the in the, in the, the steel mills, they are not important. You know, less so in France and then Germany, but even so, right? So they become think of Zola, you know, and the, those Germinal, you know, that's the background, right? They are becoming important, right? And they are getting organized, and they have leaders, and they have adopted an ideology. Most of them, anyways, some are becoming are. Are becoming anarchists, perhaps falling in Bakunin and so on, you know, Kropotkin, whatever. But most of them are socialists, meaning in the Marxist tradition, meaning a revolutionary Marxist, right? So they talk about revolution. They're going to make a revolution and they want change. And there's lots of them. And they form parties and big parties. And they are demanding change within the system at the same time as aiming for the overthrow of the system. A contradiction. 
a contradiction. Do you want to overthrow the system or do you want to change it from within? That's when to reform it. That's where eventually we have the beginning, the embryonic schism between reformist socialism, those who are happy to improve the lives of working class within the system, and the revolutionary socialists later on to be known as communists. You've heard of that term, right? They will want to overthrow the system no matter what. You know? And that is a big problem. And we have to understand that against in that that issue develops in light of another important development in the late 19th century, the last third, that's the advent, the emergence of imperialism. We're going to talk about that. So, so one important thing to keep in mind then is that in the second half of the 20th of the 19th century is the advent, the emergence of a strong working class movement, organized, ideologized, revolutionary demanding change, demanding more democracy. Oh my God, where the world's gonna end. Because on the other side is the bourgeoisie. And I just mentioned, this is a tiny group demographically. You know, they despise democracy as much as the aristocracy, the aristocracy of the church despise democracy, right? So they want, don't want democracy and they despise and hate and fear the great vector of democracy, which is called revolution. So they are now obsessed with fear of revolution and hatred for democracy. So they want to stop democracy as much as possible. And they certainly want to prevent revolution because that's going to be the end of, of our world, the end of the world, right? I mean, oh, that's the, that becomes a real, a real phobia, a real paranoia, a, a, a big thing, you know, the fear of revolution was in the air big time. Even as times were good economically, it was La Belle Epoque. But La Belle Epoque was just like old glitter and show, but below it was the fear of the masses that were all over the place, you know, and threatening. And that's the time when guys like Pareto, you know, and, uh, and many other authors are describing the masses as stupid and ignorant and dangerous, you know, les classes dangereuses, as they said in French, you know, ceux d'en bas, the lower classes, les classes dangereuses, la crapule, you know, the, 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 the awful people, you know, like, oh, wish, wish they weren't there, but we need them, of course, right? So, so the, the bourgeoisie has become, has turned against revolution, is now fearful of the masses, the working class that incorporates revolution and demands more democracy. Democracy meaning power and benefits for the demos. And the demos, that means the people, not the people from top to bottom, but ordinary people, okay? So the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy are not part of the demos. So democracy means benefits for those who need it the most, those at the bottom of society. But they're the majority, there's 90%, if not more. So democracy is not in the interest of the bourgeoisie or the aristocracy or the church. The idea that our kings and popes are Democrats is bullshit. I mean, absolute utter nonsense. I mean, they've had put up with it and they, some, they have to pretend they like it, but they hate it. I mean, the idea that the pope was, was a champion, Pope John Paul II was a champion for democracy is utter pathetic nonsense. I mean, if he was so keen on democracy, he could have started right in the Catholic Church, you know, and maybe gave some power to ordinary nuns and priests, but none of that. All the authorities from the top down to the bottom, right? none from the bottom up to the top, right? So democracy is not in, this, in the interest minorities like the aristocracy and the, um, and, and, and the, the church. Even Queen Victoria hated democracy. Democracy was a dirty word in, um, in, uh, in, 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 in Victorian England. You know, nobody wanted, people hated democracy and they feared, most of all, the way in which democracy might come about all of a sudden. And that was, that was, that was the revolution. So that is why after 1848 and after the Paris Commune in 1871, the bourgeoisie in France and elsewhere basically joins the aristocracy and joins the, 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 um, the, the church you know, in the counter-revolutionary anti-democratic camp, all right? And actually this gives them some advantage because first of all, we should remember that the, or should also know that the aristocracy has not been counted out yet. I mean, Arno Meyer has written a wonderful book about that, about the persistence of the ancien regime, how the aristocracy, the, the feudal system survived into the 20th century. I mean, we shouldn't forget, I mean, I think the idea that the 19th century was the century, the triumph of the bourgeoisie, that's exaggerated. I mean, the bourgeoisie was certainly coming on strong and then did very well for itself, thank you very much. But the old feudal classes, 
the aristocracy, they didn't do so badly. They survived Doc, nicely. They, but Doc, I think your video cut. Can you make oh, sure you're sharing your video still? Well, what, what happened here? Good morning. It says we made some improvements. Oh, boy. I don't want that. I don't want this here. Oops. Oh, what is that now? I, hey, right now, I just see your name, Jack Powell's, but I don't okay, see Hold on. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, maybe I, maybe I pushed. I'll start. I'm there back now. Perfect. Okay. Maybe I pushed something here on my keyboard. So I should have. No worries. No worries. It does. Things like that do happen. So where was I? I was saying how they, um, they, um, the aristocracy is still very much in in a, a, a player. In fact, Russia, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and uh, Ger Imperial Germany are feudal states, you know, where the aristocracy is still in control. With with in Germany, especially a very strong bourgeoisie but politically not very powerful, a bit of power, but not a lot, right? And that's, that's, a, and that's an issue there. So the there feudalism, feudal, feudalism is still alive, you might say, the aristocracy is still important, and the bourgeoisie are happy to join them because they are joining now, now that they have become counter-revolutionary, they're happy to join the super and counter-revolutionaries, the counter-revolutionaries of the first hour. I mean, the quintessential primordial revolutionaries, basically the aristocracy who everywhere, even in France, essentially control the armed forces, all right? So if you need to put down revolution, who are you gonna call? You know, revolution busters, right? I mean, <laughs> and the revolution busters, there they are. It's typical that actually, in, when putting down the Paris Commune, you know, that the, the, the government in France relied on the help from Bismarck and the Prussian army who were there you know, to make sure that the, com the communards couldn't get out of Paris, and they actually actually released Russia, uh, French prisoners of war to hope to to help the government put down the revolution, the, the, the revolution of the commune, right? So, so actually, the bourgeois bourgeoisie are very happy now to have as partners the wonderful aristocrats, the generals von this and von that, who love to beat up the proletarians. They've done so ever since 1789, and they are good at it. So the bourgeoisie is very happy. That's why with bourgeois societies, even in Belgium and France in the, 18th, in the late 1800s, they become militaristic. You know, the, the uniforms are everywhere. You look at pictures of, of the Champs-Élysées in the 1880s, the ladies and the gentlemen in uniforms, you know? I mean, women are conditioned to love men in uniforms. You know, wow, right? In Germany, the big pride of a bourgeois Spiesburger or a bourgeois petit bourgeois is to be a reserve officer in the army and walk around on Sundays with a church in a uniform. You know, that was a big deal. Same thing in Belgium, right? And even in France, you know, the, the army is still, even though the, the generals are mostly clerical types, former aristocrats, and you name it, you know, they are, they are, they are the men in uniform. They are still very much in power. So this is where the, what the bourgeoisie can count on to prevent more democracy, you know, to stop the revolution, to get rid of the revolution. And that is where obviously war now becomes you know, part of, becomes a, as a potential instrument. It has always been an instrument for putting down a revolution and for preventing democracy. And that is how the idea will be born that we can maybe use uh, the, the war, maybe a way to do it because, a second feature of the history of the 19th century is the fact that in many countries, governments, bourgeois and even aristocratic governments, as the government of uh, Imperial Germany under Bismarck, feel that with all these socialist parties becoming more and more important, and because of the, the, the some concessions have been made, the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy to prevent to avoid revolution and to prevent more democracy, they use the carrot and the stick. They have the stick ready, but the carrot also helps, you know, a little bit of something. It's like, it's a, the same idea of, of vaccination. We give them a little bit of it, of the, we take a bit of the disease to avoid the big disease itself. You know, that's the idea. So Bismarck understands that very well. And he even introduces universal suffrage for the Reich Parliament in Germany, which seems like an, a tremendous advance for democracy. It really isn't because the Reichstag has no power, but it looks good, right? And he even brings in an embryonic welfare state with some benefits for ordinary Germans, you know? And by the way, the question has to be asked, how is this finance? The answer is imperialism. We'll get, we'll get to that, I imagine, right? And it's the same in Belgium. You know, it's the same in, in many of these countries, right? 
so the um, so the, the military you know are uh, the military are there the um, the idea is that 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 we have to get rid of we, we make concessions while reserving the right to use the stick so the carrot and the stick both but these socialist parties these reformists they are happy with whatever reforms political and social they can get and the biggest party of all is the one the social democratic party in germany who are basically dealing with bismarck and deal bismarck is dealing with them so they make concessions but no sooner are concessions made then there's demand for more concessions so it drives the bourgeoisie crazy because no matter how many concessions you make there was one more there's an escalation of expectation is what they call it in, in, in organization theory they'll never end no matter how many concessions you make they'll never be happy you know and in the end when we make too many concessions they may even come to power democratically via via the ballot box and then don't even need a revolution it'll be the end of the of our world anyways it'll be the, they'll be able to do whatever they want right so we got to stop this nonsense this has got to stop there has to be to use an infamous term coined by Hitler later on, a final solution to the problem. And Endlösung, they said in Germany. So this has to stop once and for all. We cannot give them total democracy, then the masses come to power. You know, that's, that's Ortega and Gasset would write the revolt of the masses. That's the end of our civilization. That's the end of our world, right? So we got to stop. We got to find a way to stop it. What's the way to stop it? Look back at the history. What stopped the revolution in France? War. Napoleon came in. A coup d'etat warfare, externalized conflict rather than internalized. Conflict, class war, war at home, oh, civil war, so to speak, conflict at home can be this, can be, you might say, appeased, you know, can be halted, can be ended by war abroad. You know? An external conflict to avoid an internal conflict. Fight a foreign enemy to avoid having to fight the class enemy or avoid a class enemy from causing trouble. You know, uh, class conflict, class war never stops. You know, sometimes saying that there's, uh, it, it, there is no class war or ending it means we win. We, we want to continue it, but you have to lay down your we weapons. That's really the idea. So you can see how war becomes attractive. And war is not only shown, has shown itself historically to be a way to stop the revolution, the wars after the French Revolution. But war is now also presented by these bourgeois philosophers I just talked about, you know, especially Nietzsche, as you know, a necessary evil, as basically the, the, the only solution. The army is seen to be this, the, the, the school, the model for the nation. You know. In fact, even the, the, idea, the army is seen as the perfect organization where orders are given by those above, that's us. You know. And those below obey Unconditional. That's a la guerre comme a la guerre, the French say, right? Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could run a society like that? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could run our factories like that, you know? Our workers like soldiers, you know? And me, the general, you know, Herr in Eigen Haus, our lord in my own house, you know? That's the idea. That's the idea, right? So the, the, the war is a model, the militarization of society. Even, even new organizations that are, that are created, charities, you know, the Salvation Army. Right? In uniform, right? The Boy Scouts, you know, basically kids playing, playing at being, 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 being in the army, essentially, you know. So there's a militarization and there's a glorification of war, and men in uniforms are so so wonderful looking ladies, aren't they? Right? And that's the whole thing. War seems to be seems to have in you know, it the possibility to end all this misery, to end this tension. And uh, that is why. That is why it seems to the bourgeoisie, as the century is, goes towards an end, the fin de siècle atmosphere, when people are really worried about the end of the world is in sight. You know, the fin, it's the end of the world. It's going to be like the year 1000 in the Middle Ages. You know, the, the, the world will end. The bourgeois world may end unless there's a new Big Bang. And what's the new Big Bang going to be? The war. Right? And indeed, it seems urgent. Because in the so-called Belle Epoque, you know, is actually it's not so such a Belle Epoque at all. It's awful. In fact, the years 1910, 11, 12, you know, there's strikes, demonstrations, riots all over the place. And guess what? In 1912, you know, many in, in Germany, the Social Democrats 
scored the biggest electoral victory ever. They seem to be on the verge of getting a majority. Oh my God, then they'll they'll just change everything even without a revolution. You know, it's gonna be the end, the end of the world. We gotta have a war. We gotta have a war, so that's to stop, you know. Because there's a fear, there's a fear that there's the bourgeoisie, as the bourgeoisie sees it, that there's a race going on out there. It's a race between war and revolution. It's gonna be either one, binary thinking, right? This or that, right? Binary thinking. It's gonna be a, a race, war, revolution. You know, if revolution wins, if revolution happens tomorrow, and it could happen any day, you know, it's the end of us. It's the end of the world. My God, you know, we have, that's an unthinkable. It's the, it's the end of our world. But if war wins, war is win, the end of revolution. And a la guerre, come a la guerre. When there's war, you know, no more fuss, no more parliaments, no more talk. You know, everybody will obey orders. We'll give the orders. They will obey. And that's what happens in 1914. These the scenes of joy at Paris, where the pictures were not taken you know, in Eastern poor proletarian Paris. No, they were taken on the Champs Elysees. The pictures in Germany were taken along the Unter den Linden Boulevard. Ladies in beautiful hats, you know, gentlemen in fine uniforms, university students, bourgeois. They were happy. They were relieved because the tension, they couldn't bear the tension anymore. What will it be? A revolution or war? Oh my God, you know. Yeah. Right. And then what's so fascinating about this uh, story as you kind of outline it too, is that ultimately this, this backfired, right? That, uh, yes. At, uh, at first, it worked very well. Right. At first, at first, it, our first democracy was suspended. Everywhere, the army takes over. In France, for example, you know, the, basically the, the, the civilian government steps aside. And General General Joffre takes over. Later on, to be followed by Clemenceau, who's a dictator. Right? Uh, the sa same thing in England. Lloyd George will, will rule dictatorially, you know, not not formally, but de facto dictatorially. Right? In Germany, the uh, Ludendorff will take over. You know, no more social democrats. Just just basically do nothing. The Belgian government exile. It's King Albert who decides everything. The Belgian Parliament is sent to Le Havre. And you can sit there and just uh, eat camembert for, and drink red wine for the, for four years, but nothing to say. Everything is King Albert, right? So it's King Albert, it's Kaiser Billy, it's Ludendorff, it's Clemenceau. I mean, there's no more democracy at all. And in fact, democracy is not only political, it's also social. Democracy also means, for example, uh, limits on the working hours and such. Well, a la guerre comme à la guerre. It's war, guys. No more 12 hours a day, only working 16 hours a day. And working Saturdays, yes, because for the fatherland, you know what I mean? Hello, the fatherland that was so good to you before the war, right? And that's why that's why the socialists, the reformers say, well, yeah, that's true. You know, the fatherland, Germany, mother Germany was good to us. We can eat sausages every day, you know. We got to fight for that because if the Ruskies beat us, then there'll be no more sausage in our place. Mm -hmm. So we have to fight for the fatherland in France too. You know, if we don't fight for, for the, the La République, you know, the nasty Germans will come and get us. So they all believe in, the, in, in this, this nonsense. And we got to talk about imperialism to explain this mindset. But that's what happens. But so at first it works very well. I mean, the people do meekly accept, you know, the new state of affairs, which means that from now on, no more democracy, you know, done. And of course, also anybody who makes a fuss is thrown in jail, right? Uh, pacifists, revolutionaries, you keep talking revolution, you're in jail, off you go, right? So no no patience, you know, zero tolerance, okay? That is That shows the victory, that shows that the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy, that's what they wanted. That's what they expect from war, the end of democracy, the, the end of revolution, the specter of revolution is gone, right? And now we are in charge. And the idea was that if we win this war, we'll keep it that way. That was the idea, right? We'll keep it that way. But it doesn't work out. Why does it not work out? Why does it backfire? One of the great, great ironies of history is that the war that was supposed to be the war against democracy and the war to chase away for once and for all the specter of revolution ends up producing the biggest of all revolutions and therefore also creating the need to introduce democracy elsewhere to avoid revolution. So that's, that's, that is actually what will happen with consequences to be discussed later on that will lead to the Second World War. Indeed, that's, um, that's, that, that is, at the beginning, it works very well, but then the reason why it doesn't work after, in the long run, is what I just said, the war causes pauperization. 
it pauperizes even those workers who have been pampered, thank her, who have been pampered a little bit by the likes of Bismarck and in Belgium and France, thanks to the to the super profits achieved by the super exploitation of people in the third world, in the global south, right, in the colonies, right? But during the war, that is finished. So no more sausages and sauerkraut and potatoes on your plate in Germany. That's why there has been a revolution. That's how the revolution starts. And the revolution is everywhere at the end of the war. And to avoid it from actually succeeding or to avoid pseudo or, 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 or almost revolutionary situations, quasi-revolutionary situations to develop into real revolutions that might succeed. That's why from above, they bring in reforms a la Bismarck very quickly. The eight hour day, please. Universal suffrage, please. Please take this. See how good you have it. So reforms, democratic reforms, despised by the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie, but brought in to avoid revolution a la Russe. You know, that's why suddenly then at the end of the war, at the end of World War I, you have a situation where the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie, that symbiosis, as Joseph Schumpeter called it, of the two classes that are now one single elite, one upper class, you know, when they suddenly have to, have to, have to put up with the opposite of what they expected from the war. They wanted the war to do away once and for all with the revolution and stop the democratic nonsense. And instead, they have the revolution, you know, basically in Russia that succeeded, and they have to introduce more democracy in France, in Belgium, in England, in Holland, and all over the place. What are you going to do about that? Are they going to put up with it? No. And what will be their solution? We know that already, fascism. Right. You know, Jacques, um, just a quick question about the, the evolution of our conversation, because I see that we're an hour in, but oh. I also think that there's a lot to unpack. So I'm yes. wondering if maybe we should, would you be amenable to the idea of doing a second part so sure. that we don't have to rush through? We don't have time, yeah. We can do it. There's lots to talk about, of course. Yeah, I'm sorry if I take too long sometimes. Oh, no, I'm, uh, no, I'm not saying that because you're taking too much time. I'm saying that because I'm very intrigued by the conversation. And my next question has to do with really understanding the imperial context of World War I and the inter-imperialist rivalry that was operative, yes. Yes. as well as the split that you alluded to, but I want to hear a little bit more about between the social democratic parties within Europe and in particular in Germany, who took a line that was more reformist versus the Bolshevik orientation of a revolutionary socialism that took a very different position on the national question and imperialism. And I think it's really important for people to see this moment, this watershed moment of class struggle that backfired for the ruling class. Also at the level of the working classes, as you're saying, there was class struggle between two different orientations, the kind of social democratic reformism versus the revolutionary socialism manifested most clearly. Can I talk about that now still? Do you still have time to talk about that now? Uh, if, if you're amenable. No, I, I, I'm sure I, I can talk again. We can continue tomorrow, but I mean, I can continue a bit about that now because we have to talk about the Second World War and fascism and stuff like that, I guess, still, right? Yeah, exactly. So maybe maybe we could have this be the, the uh, final question or penultimate yes. question. And then we and talk then about... Part two could be fascism, right. World War II, and the present. Does that work? Okay, well, what, okay, let's, I want to respond to what you said. It was a very good question. In the meantime, I can think of an answer. As I say, it was a very, very good question. Okay, yeah, I can think of something. Um, to, understand, to understand the First World War in general, to understand the 19th century, to understand the 20th century, you got to keep in mind another development of the 19th century that I have not yet mentioned, and that's the rise of imperialism, right? Because, and that's another big shortcoming of historiography and the media today that it's as if imperialism doesn't exist. It's like, you know, you would never think there's been imperialism. Well, if it is, it's the other guys. It's China that's imperialist, you know, or and Russia, imperialist. But we're not. We're, we're, we're such good guys, you know. We, not, never, never have been, never, we, oh, didn't even dream of it, right? Oh, well, excusez-moi, <laughs> the history tells me differently, you know, <laughs> I could give you some facts. <laughs> In the 19th century, imperialism arises, and it really means that capitalism, which is now, by the way, had moved, have more, has morphed from its 18th century manifestation, commercial mercantile capitalism, into full-fledged industrial and financial capitalism. This is the 
hallmark of the 19th century, right? It will also now, by the from about 1870 on, will also now basically expand, spread its wings all over the world and become imperialism. So imperialism what I'm, is the international worldwide manifestation of a European phenomenon originally called capitalism, right? Having said that, in a way, capitalism was imperialism beginning. Right? Capitalism is not, some people think it's, it's like the air around us. It has always been with us, you know. It was only discovered. Its existence was only discovered, you know, <laughs> like gases, you know, <laughs> by, by scientists fairly recently, but it's always been there, you know. So, some people see capitalism everywhere, right? And I'm thinking of even certain great historians who, when they see trade, for example, they think it's capitalism. Like Fernand Brodel is a great, a great historian. I love Fernand Brodel, but he, he's a lousy social economic historian. And anyways, so capitalism originated in the 16th century. Uh, and I won't get into the details of that. There's some great books about that, by the way, which I can recommend. And it originated the context of the worldwide expansion of Europe, which we call the great discoveries. I like that term, you know, it doesn't hurt anybody. It can't can can be against that, you know, <laughs> even though why do these people that we discovered object to being told that they were discovered? <laughs> well, that's a different story again. We can talk about that some, some other time. But what I'm saying is the cap capitalism involving, and not, I'm not defining it, I'm just saying involving the accumulation of unseen wealth, all right? to be used for the production of more products to produce more unseen wealth. The, the continuing, never ending capital accumulation, that idea, right? Enriching uh, the few and causing misery for the many, all right? That, I'm, not, I'm not trying to define it here. I'm just uh, giving you some characteristics. Started in the context of the great discoveries and more honestly, the more great conquests of a whole new continent which we call today the Americas. You know, I guess in Europe, we call it one continent, but here in North America, they see two continents, you know, North and South, right? But the Panama Canal, just to show that there's a difference, right? I checked it, I sailed to the Panama Canal and it's true, <laughs> two continents now. <laughs> and, and of course, all of Africa, basically. But so the conquests were there right from the start. And that's what made capitalism great again, <laughs> or, or great for the first time, to use Trumpian language, right? And um, it made it made it turn some people into capitalists, and it was it, that was that those great riches that that capital accumulation was made possible thanks to conquest, murder, you know, forced labor, slavery, you name it. Once again, Balzac said, "Behind every great fortune, there hides a crime. Behind the great fortune amassed by capitalism today hides a big crime of slavery, conquest, murder, genocide." You know. To make room also for for settlers, and that's a different story again, right? Anyway, so that's where capitalism starts. So in a way, capitalism was imperialist from the beginning. No doubt about it. But capitalism became uber imperialist in from about 1870, 1880 on, and that has to do with the changes within capitalism itself, uh, domestic changes, namely the, the development of of you might say. The, 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 the productivity within the capitalist system. Because one of the benefits of the capitalist system, which Marx acknowledged, is that it really increased, it brought enormous increases in productivity. You know, factories could crank out many more products than artisans ever did in their little workshops, right? So the productivity was in, in, increased enormously. And of course, machines were brought in, you know, and, and oh, lots of reasons why. And, uh, and the, at the beginning, capitalism was just basically producers producing diligently on their own as best they could and selling, competing with each other in the free market and all that stuff. That was the idea, laissez-faire, the free market, that was the idea of, of idealism in its early stage. But with, with, this, um, with, with this increase in productivity, it also involves a, an enormous investments in machinery and the building of huge factories. So it leads to gigantism to the, the formation of major units of production, as opposed to little workshops where mom and dad are working, one mom and dad shops. So big firms, anonymous companies, were made possible by, by money being collected from thousands of people, you know, by banks, and then the money invested in big firms to produce even more before, right? And you have what Marxists sometimes call monopoly capitalism. You know? 
basically the, the, the formation of trusts and huge companies, you know, uh, as opposed to mom, mom and dad operations, right? And these guys can outperform the mom and dad places. So the little guys fall by the wayside and the big ones survive. And the big ones compete with each other. And in those days, multinationals were not yet a thing of the future. And most companies were national companies, you know, for example, the French companies, German companies, and they together then were the big players, the, the, the great commanding heights of the national economies, you know, the Volkswirtschaft, as they say in Germany, you know, the people's economy, right? Uh, people, well, some people's economy. <laughs> Anyways, so you have now basically competition, the class struggle, struggle between big and small capitalists, big business and small business. Who's going to win? Big business. Small business, <clears throat> don't really say. Even today, small business still being squeezed out. The history of the last 200 years is the history of 150 years is the history of small business being wiped out by big business. That's class struggle. That's class struggle. Of course, today, the people who of big business, little business are told it's all the fault of socialism or communism or whatever, right? But I mean, they don't understand that their real enemy is big business, you know? <laughs> and, but the people in little business end up voting for the people who represent big business. You know, go, go figure, right? <laughs> Anyways, but that's another, that's another story, I guess. So, so you have competition, you have the big boys taking over and big companies now producing more and more and more and the banks are helping them to finance and set them up. And then they make these super, the super production leads to super profits that have to be invested. That, that's what capitalism is all about. Capitalism is not just to consume to meet the needs. No, capitalism is to consume to make more money, right? to produce, to make more money and more money and more money and more money. And after that, more money, you know, growth is supposed to be forever. I mean, there's a big fat illusion going around the world these days that, you know, that it can be sustained growth. Oh, yeah, sustained growth doesn't exist. You know, growth has to end somewhere. I could talk about the president of the Roman Empire, but maybe some other time. But anyway, so as production grows and there's more and more money being made, these companies get bigger. And if you're a big industrialist in little Belgium, Belgium is too small for you. France is too small for you. Germany is too small for you. You have to, you have to look beyond the borders. The world is yours. The world is your oyster. You know, because we need raw materials. You know, the steel mills need iron ore. You know, need copper. You know, especially electricity was invented. Copper wires, copper, oh, copper. Where's where's the copper? You know, you need copper, but do, does your industry? Do you have copper in your in your in your in your? In your uh, hmm. Belgium, had, Belgium was becoming a big industrial power at the time. Fourth big industrial power in the world on the eve of this first world war. Why? Thanks to the Congo, copper from the Congo, guys. Hello, you know, that's, and later on, uranium. The Americans built their first atom bomb with uranium of Belgium, you know, the Congo, uh, not, not Belgium, the Congo. Anyways, so the raw materials, you have to get them wherever, right? And of course, also, and when you produce more with the stuff you get from all over the world, and of course, as cheaply as possible, which means you get it from your own colonies rather than from some other country, right? Then you got to sell, you got to have markets. So the idea now is to spread around the world, to lay your hands on, on raw materials, to be able to sell your products there on exclusive markets, you know, and also, by the way, to use the cheap labor over there. Because guess what? Because of those stupid revolutionaries, we had to abolish slavery. Well, that was a fine system, I thought, slavery. You know, these people were happy to work for us, you know. But now we lost them. Now they've just gone to the hills and just still living out their goats and they're not really working for us anymore. We have to have cheap labor. The coolie system will take over, okay? We'll bring them in. So for, especially when it's hard, dirty work, like building railways in Canada to the Rocky Mountains. I don't want to do that. Bring in the Chinese. Bring in the Indians. So the, the Blacks don't want to work on the, on, the, on the sugar plantations anymore in Jamaica. Bring them in from India, from Calcutta, you know? I always wondered when I first came to Canada and the Caribbean, why are so many Indians living in the Caribbean? Well, they were deportees, guys. They were deported. You know, the, the same with the Chinese, and they were deported in huge numbers. During the First World War, the availability of cheap colonial labor will help Britain and France to win the war. I have a good friend in Belgium now who's written, just written a book about that, about how basically the labor of Indians and, and, and Chinese coolies and also Indian soldiers 
actually helped Britain to, to win the war, the First World War, you know, but we, we don't normally hear about that. And if I, I travel a lot in France, I told you, I learned a lot from my travels. One of the sites to see when you're in the area of Abbeville is a huge First World War Chinese cemetery. Uh, you never expect that to see that, but there it is, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of graves, Chinese, not soldiers, no, but do, do, do dirty work behind the lines, bury the dead, dig the trenches, you know, construct roads, very important. Anyways, so, so, so capitalism becomes worldwide, a worldwide phenomenon, imperialism, right? And it has, having colonies is the big thing. It seems you have, or penetrate economic, or simply conquer, right? Some capitalist core countries, Metropoles, we'll call them later on. Actually, are lucky that next door there's lots of space where you can find all these goodies. That happened in the United States. The United States had a whole Wild West to conquer, right? And boy, they went for it. And it's only when that's done, when the that done, that they start to look beyond the borders in the Pacific. You're going west, young man. Go west, young man. Well, go further west, young man. Go to Hawaii. You know, annex Hawaii the way Saddam Hussein annexed Kuwait. Oh no, I shouldn't talk about that. No, no, they wanted to be annexed. No, I'm not so sure. And then Guam, you know, and then China. Everybody wanted China. The problem with China was China was too big for one country to swallow as a colony. But we could divide it. And we created mini colonies in China, right? Chinese remember these things, you know, that, that we, you know, all be Britain, France, Japan had created mini colonies. The Chinese were forced to cough up cities and entire districts for the West to create mini colonies. And everybody dreamed of at least an economic penetration of China to build railways there, for example. You know, I know Belgium, where I'm from, you know, they, they, put, they put in a lot of streetcars in places like Shanghai because streetcar production was a Belgian specialty in those days, you know. So uh, they all look, they all want to look all over the world now for my favorite American word, opportunities. Yes, it's all about opportunities, you know. It's like the capitalist ideology or the, the, the idea today is that Life is a matter of opportunity. You know? Fate sprinkles opportunities around, you know, and some of us are lucky and smart and bright and take advantage of the opportunities. Right? So in those days, you know, capitalists, capitalism, originally a European phenomenon, and I include the United States in Neo-Europe and Canada. These were Neo-Europe's you know, in the new world. Right? They took advantage of the opportunities to spread their wings all over the world. Right? And you know what? That worked well in terms of solving the problem that we had at home with those pesky socialists and their ideas of revolution and demands for reforms. Because with the extra profits we make by exploiting and oppressing the poor people over there, by making the blacks dig out the copper in the Congo for us, we just provide a foreman, you know, and we pay them nothing for a pittance, right? With those extra profits, we can now throw some crumbs of the table of the riches of the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy and give the plebs, give the demos a few little benefits. That is what is behind the embryonic welfare state created, established, conjured up by Bismarck. And it's the same thing that happens in Belgium. It's the wealth of the Congo of which a little bit, most of it goes in our pockets and a little bit goes to you guys here. Aren't you lucky? Aren't you happy? And, and, this then, this pampering of the proletarians produces basically a bit of an elite. Those, those actually, I say, oh, life isn't so bad under capitalism. In Belgium, where I come from, you know, the idea was that a, a worker could someday eat steak with his French fries. You know, French fried potatoes, of course, you couldn't live without those. You know, it's a mayonnaise inside, but a steak with that. Imagine that, you know. And the working man could actually eat a steak. Well, the socialist said, you know, we now have once in a while a steak with our frites, you know, wow. So isn't that a wonderful little country we live in? You know? When it comes to war, we have to defend it because when the nasty Germans come in, we may have to eat only wieners or sausages, you know, and that's not nearly as good, right? You know what I mean? That is how, how then you might say that the working class is bribed and becomes nationalistic and somehow senses that this became possible because of what our country is doing in Africa. But if we are realistic about that and realize that we basically, that capitalism is exporting misery for our benefit 
to people in that world, and we should be explain some solidarity with these people, right? No, we, we don't want to think about that. We know that they're poor, and, but you know what? It's because they're just so backward over there, you know? And they're, they're, they're pretty dumb, you know? We are smart, we are hard workers. That's why our, our, the improvement of our lot has to do with the fact that we are smart, you know? And we are hard workers. And those black folks over there, you know, or these yellow folks or these brown folks or whatever, you know, they just don't have it, you know. They just they don't have that je ne sais quoi, you know, that drive, you know, that ambition. They don't know how to take advantage of the opportunities the way we do, you know. So that's too bad, so sad. So the working class, as it becomes spoiled, as it becomes an aristocracy, a labor aristocracy, becomes nationalistic and drops its internationalism. All right. That'll make it possible for the Belgians to fight the Germans and the French and so forth on each other, right? Because it's the French fry eaters, you know, and the steak eaters against the sausage eaters. You know what I mean? They, and we all owe our French fries and our steaks and our sausages to our government, our dear government, right? And you know, so that is going to be that is the, the reason why the, the working class becomes well, first even more reformist because they're getting they're getting what they want. They feel that their demands for reforms they they we, we achieve that, so we're successful. And life is getting better. What more can you want? And guys like Bernstein, the reformist socialists in Germany and Van der Velde in Belgium are not only the champions of reformism, but of colonialism. Now, don't get me wrong. They're against the excesses of colonialism, okay? I mean, they want, they want the, the supervisors and the mines in Katanga to be nice to the workers, okay? I mean, and give them a bit of time off once in a while, you know? And make sure they have enough bananas to eat and give them the benefit of our belief system with said missionaries and that they should be very grateful for that. You know, I had a sister who was a missionary in Congo and she knows all about it. Anyway, so that's how, that's how the working class in countries like Belgium, France, Germany, countries that have colonies, all right? Colonies to exploit, all right? Hence the possibility of making the concessions for the bourgeoisie, you know, how these working class, this labor aristocracy becomes nationalistic, will be willing to die for the dear fatherland in 14, right? And becomes racist, okay? Becomes racist to this very day. Today, you hear racism is an attitude, you know? We should all change our attitudes. It's bullshit, it's bullshit. There's a material, materialist reason for racism. It's built in, but our well-being here, mine today, you know, it's all due to the exploitation of, of the third world, you know. I mean, Belgium became very prosperous, one of the most prosperous countries in Europe, in the world. Right? Why? Why? Well, we like, we like to think that we work hard workers and smart, and we know how to take advantage of opportunities, you know. And the Dutch are also, right? Well, it has to do with maybe with the fact that Holland owned Indonesia for a few hundred years, and Belgium exploited the Congo only for a hundred years, but boy, did a thorough job, you know. That's where the prosperity came from. But we don't want to know that. Yeah. And France being prosperous, you know, the red wine on the table, camembert, the whole works, cocova, you know. Tell us the Algerians, the Senegalese, you know, the, the Vietnamese where it came from, you know. I was in Vietnam a couple of times, you know, like it's, Vietnam is a very nice country now, but I read a bit about the history. I, you know, I told you how I, uh, how my travels, I learned a lot my, through my travels. I read a book by a Vietnamese historian about their country. Uh, the French were pretty nasty colonizers in Vietnam. You know? And I, when I travel to France, I like to look at my Michelin guide sometimes to find a good restaurant. Michelin became rich and famous and rich, 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 thanks to the rubber of Vietnam. And the rubber was produced by the plebes over there and they were not well treated. And it's why they made a revolution to get rid of the French, right? But I mean, we don't think about that, right? But we don't think about that. Pardon me. Well, let me let me just. Um, this is so important what you're saying, and I, and I think we'll probably bring the conversation to a close here in, in the next ten minutes or so. But there's one we, we've arrived right at the point at which we can see, on the one hand, as you pointed out, the rise of this, you know, the form of imperialism, the kind of high stage of imperialism, if you will, is a conflict between the big business interests and the kind of smaller businesses, as you were highlighting. But then. The flip side of that, in the socialist camp, there's also class struggle, right? And you're highlighting the extent to which a lot of the European kind of 
you know, there'll be different terminology for this, the labor aristocracy, et cetera. But then you have the Bolsheviks, right? Right, well, I was gonna to get to that. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's I, was, exactly... I was actually said, I said at one point, Excellent. I said at one point, the, the, the labor aristocracy in countries that had colonies, okay? So for the bourgeoisie, the elite, to be able to make the concessions that I just described, okay? And, and appeased the reformer socialists. There had to be plenty of colonies to be exploited, to create super profits over there, to throw crumbs on the table. But Italy, for example, Italy only had Libya, you know, as a colony. Well, you know, mostly sand, you know, oil was not yet a big deal in those days. The countries of Eastern Europe you know, and Russia had were underprivileged in terms of what what was to be what was grabbed up during the imperialist rat race, the scramble for Africa. Africa in particular became the source of great wealth, you know, in the, in this context, right? More than anything, else, Africa. Africa is a very rich country, right? And it's today so poor because the wealth for a hundred years and still today goes north. You know, it goes north. There's no there's no denying that, right? I'm sure there's some good books about that that I'm expecting to read sometime, but I already get the picture. Okay? So it was the countries that were, were had a chance to grab some of the loot of Africa that were able to do this and make their, their, their labor, a labor aristocracy, make their socialists, reformist socialists, but not all of them. There were always some, some, some stubborn guys who were not. You know? But in countries like Russia, you know, where there was not the same kind of imperialism. Well, there was hardly any capitalism had not developed yet. Russia was still 80%, 90% feudal, basically. The wealth based on land ownership run by the aristocracy and the industry was not developed yet. And sure, Russia had a big empire in Siberia, but it was not, it was not exploiting it and, 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 and doing to Siberia and Central Asia what Europe was doing to Africa. Right? So there, there was no rewards going to the working class. There, the working class remained poor and pissed off, so to speak, you know, as my friend, friend of mine used to, put, used to put it, and therefore did not become reformist, kept on believing in revolution. Lenin is an example of that. And the same thing in Italy. The Italian working class, the Italian socialists were never reformed, never did become, well, they become after the war, but they did not become reformist. The state remained overwhelmingly revolutionary because Italy, the Ital Italian industry, Italian capitalism could not offer to its working class, you know, what say the Belgian industry could offer to the Belgian working class. By the way, you see in the movie by Bertolucci, 1900, which really should be called the 20th century. You know the movie Bertolucci by, by 1900? It's a wonderful movie that, 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 that illustrates the situation in uh, the social conditions in Northern Italy at that time. So that is the reason why then, why, why the revolutionary potential basically was neutralized, not totally gone, neutralized in a way that Marx could not have foreseen because of imperialism, which had, was just starting by the time Marx had died already. And it took another Marxist called Lenin you know, to actually understand by 1916 what was going on. And he wrote the famous, his famous pamphlet book on imperialism. But I mean, Lenin wasn't the only one. Hobson already, and some English liberal writer had already observed what was going on, already sensed that imperialism created a whole new ballgame you know, and new rules, and it would affect the working class attitude towards society, towards revolution, you know, making them more reformist, and towards the country, making them patriotic, making them nationalists, and diminishing their internationalism. And that is why the, the Social Democrats in Germany became a party, a national became a party of nationalists and of, um, uh, of, um, you know, of, 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 of racists also. You could also say, to put it differently, that this whole situation led to an embourgeoisement, a bourgeoisification, a petty bourgeoisification of the working class. Certainly of the leaders, the leading cadres of the Social Democratic Party. You know, there was this famous book, what's it called, by, uh, about, about how, how, the, um, how there was um, the, the, the leadership of the Social Democratic Party, Michels. Do you know Robert Michels? Do you know that book? Robert Michels was, an, was an, uh, the author of a book published just before the First World War in which he described what was going on in the Social Democratic Party in Germany, how the, they were now better off, and not only the rank and file, but especially the leadership 
was becoming bourgeois, very petty bourgeois. They were adopting a petty bourgeois mindset as a result of the success of their demands for reform, which had demands that had been met by the likes of Bismarck and the government industrialists and funded with the super profits made in the colonies. So that's Robert Michels has a, a very good book about that. And I wish, I wish I know the name of it now, but anyways, it's a classic, a classic study. So yeah, so that's the difference. So that's, that's why then contrary to what Marx had more or less predicted that revolution could be expected in the capitalistically most developed countries, it was gonna happen on the periphery in the capitalist countries that missed the imperialist boat, so to speak, you know, and that stayed in their own backwaters. You know? uh, and then therefore where their working class was not spoiled, not privileged, not, did not become patriotic, did not become you know, nationalist, did not become as racist. Right? And that, that's, that, that's, how, that's how the revolution when it could happen and succeed in Russia you know, and elsewhere, which is not to say there was no longer any re potential revolution. I told you earlier how the, the war created the potential for revolution, you know, popularized people and therefore created a revolutionary potential also in Belgium, Holland, France, Britain, Switzerland, you know, and so on. Well, this has been remarkably helpful, Jacques. Thank you so much for talking us through this. We've been basically from the French Revolution through the 19th century to the World War One and the emergence of the Russian Revolution. So, uh, I, I shall walk. <laughs> yeah, it was hopefully next time we can pick up kind of where we left off here with the Bolsheviks and then the emergence of fascism in the interwar period as right. a kind of, you know, amongst other things, a response to that growing threat of real revolutionary socialism. And as well, I think it's really important that you highlighted the kind of anti colonial internationalist dimension right. that you find in Lenin and the Bolsheviks. And that I'm sure we'll. Uh, revisit as it manifests itself in Ho Chi Minh and Mao and others yes, later on, right? Very important, yes. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining me. My and pleasure. we will uh, carry on with part two in, in due time. Okay. Any idea when you would like to do that? <laughs>